Hello, friends, and welcome to this online service of First Presbyterian Church in Sterling, Illinois, for the week of August 21st, 2022. I had to stop and think about what day it was. We're so glad that you've come to join us. If this is your first time, know that we are a welcoming congregation. We're LGBTQ inclusive. We are committed to social justice in the name of the gospel and committed to doing the work that brings glory to God in our community and our nation and in the world and in our daily lives. So we're glad that you've come to join us. If you would like to be part of our ministry and our mission, here in Sterling and, and the work we do in other places, you are so welcome to join us. We would welcome your prayers. We'd be so grateful if you would join with us in prayers and in supplication to God, asking for God's blessing on the work we do and for God to prosper us in, in all ways. We would be grateful for your presence if you'd like to come and join us. Our worship services are at 9.30 a.m. Sunday mornings at 410 Second Avenue in beautiful downtown Sterling, Illinois. It's a wonderful community, both inside the church and surrounding it. So we, we would love to have you come and be with us. And if you'd like to support the work we do by your financial gifts, we'd welcome that too. You can give online at our website by just finding the donate button and clicking on that, or you can um, mail in a check if you'd like to 410 Second Avenue, and we'd be grateful for that. And if you come to our worship service, there is a giving center, and in this video, you'll see a QR code where you can also give. So there are plenty of ways that you can support us in whatever way you can. We thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for praying with us and for us. Thank you for your contributions and thank you for your presence, even if it is in spirit alone. We're so glad that you've come to join us and we hope that you will find this service to be uplifting and that it will enlighten you and perhaps entertain you a little bit and above all, that it will lead you to deeper faith. Thanks for being here. Our first reading for this Sunday of August 21st is a prayer based on the scripture that you will hear in just a few moments. It is a prayer for us as we run our race. It is written in first person, so I hope you will join your heart in this prayer. O oh God, your grace is beyond measure, and it was graciously extended to me the very instant I began to run this race. You prepare the way for me and you guide my feet. But even more in Jesus Christ, you run alongside me, enabling me to cast off the things that weigh me down. Your spirit gives my spirit the power to endure and stay on course. In false starts and lagging zeal, you are with me. In triumph and in bursts of energy, you are with me. Your spirit is my second wind. You keep me on course, reminding me that the one who triumphs in the end is not the one who runs swiftly, nor the one who runs best, but the one who endures to the end. I want to be among that number, and by your grace I will finish well. I will run this race you have set before me, encouraged and strengthened by the faith of those who have gone before and are now a part of that great cloud of witnesses that surround me. Amen.
Our scripture reading for today comes from the book of Hebrews, as it did for last week's service. This reading follows directly on that reading that we heard last week when we heard about the definition of faith, the assurance of things hoped for, and the conviction of things not seen. In this reading, we hear about what faith has demanded of people in the past and what it demands of us. We hear about the difficulties of faithful people as they follow God instead of the world, instead of governments, instead of empire. We hear about suffering, true suffering. And at the end of the reading, we hear a phrase that begins, therefore. Long ago, back in my childhood, a preacher said in a sermon, when you hear that word, therefore, it tells you whatever you just read is there for. So we're going to do something a little bit different today. We're going to hear this scripture, but we're going to start with the therefore, with Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. And then we'll go back to the reading from chapter 11 and follow all the way down to the end of chapter 11. And then we'll hear once again, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 12, what that is all there for. Let's listen for God's word for, to us today in Hebrews 11, 29 through 12, 2. I'll start with chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, the therefore. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Now back to verse chapter 11, starting in verse 29. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry land, but when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the spies in peace. And what more should I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better so that they would not without us be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have you ever leafed through a family photo album with an older family member? When you did, probably that family member told you stories about the people who were depicted in those photos. Hebrews 11 is like a family photo album. It gives us little snapshots of some of our ancestors in faith. These are the people from whom we received a legacy of faith, an inheritance. 
They're people known and named, giants in the faith like the Israelites and the outsiders and foreigners and aliens. And all of those named are heroes in the album. And the unnamed are our heroes as well. Though we do not specifically know their names of everyone depicted, we know that they suffered for their faith. And they are the pictures in our photo album and they are the people who populate that great cloud of witnesses you heard about in the scripture. They surround us. They form us, they inform us, and their sufferings help us make sense of our own troubles. The race they ran was not always easy, but that's the way faith works sometimes. In fact, it may be the way faith works most of the time. There's a story, and it's not true, but it's such a good story, about Ernest Shackleton, the man who formed an Antarctic expedition when that was had not been done before. He was putting together this Antarctic expedition, and the story goes that he posted an ad, which could well be an ad for Christianity. Here's what that ad supposedly said. Men wanted for hazardous journey small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in the event of success. Even though the ad is fictional, it gives us a sense of what Shackleton's crew would face on that Antarctic expedition. It's an amazing story how they survived. And the ship they were on was called the Endurance. Endurance, as you probably know, is surviving difficulty. It's part of perseverance. The only way we can persevere is to endure first. But perseverance is continuing on after we've endured hardship. And that's the therefore of this text, perseverance. Perseverance is required in the work of faith. It's the only way that we can run the race. In the examples we're given, we're reminded of Moses. Think about what his family endured. They were enslaved in Egypt when the Pharaoh ordered that all the male babies should be killed. His parents defied the law in order for Moses to survive. And then having survived, Moses himself challenged the Pharaoh, defied him, challenging empire in order to free the people. Christians of the first century, as we heard last week, faced all sorts of persecution and trouble from the government. This was not about reproductive rights or library books or prayer in school. This was about lordship of Jesus Christ and not Caesar. This was about resistance to an idolatrous culture and endurance of the persecution that came with that resistance. This was perseverance, doing what Jesus had told them to do, love God, love neighbor, live in peace, bless the poor, welcome the stranger, and care for those in need. The writer of Hebrews, in laying out those snapshots in the family album, depicts the people who endured and then persevered. And they now surround us in that great cloud of witnesses, cheering us on as we run our race. As we reflect on this family photo album, I invite you to take a moment and think about who's in your photo album as a part of your own cloud of witnesses. Who were the people who formed you, who taught you faith, who modeled for you what it means to endure and to persevere? Who were the people who, as Mr. Rogers said, loved you into being? Picture them in your mind, look at their faces, Consider what they endured. Consider how they persevered. Consider what it took for them to be the faithful person that you knew. Take a moment and think about them. Pause the video if you'd like. Now, think about a generation into the future, maybe two generations even, and think about someone long after you're gone looking at a picture of you and describing you to a younger person. Think about who that might be and what they might say. What do you hope will be said of you and about the faith that you modeled and shared? What do you hope they will say about the way you endured, about the way you persevered, about the way you did the work that was set before you? 
to bring the love of Jesus to others in this world. Take a moment and think about that. And if it's helpful for you to remember it, write down what you've thought about. Pause the video for a moment if you'd like. I've shared with you many times the story of my grandmother Schultz. She raised nine children. She endured poverty. She endured abuse from her husband. And then at age 61, my grandma learned to speak Spanish and went to Mexico City from Wichita, Kansas to serve in a mission in the poorest part of that city. She persevered. But today I want to tell you about her in-laws, Meshach and Edith Schultz, the parents of my alcoholic grandfather. Meshach and Edith were founding members of Zion Lutheran Church in the small town of Shipman, Illinois. Meshach kept those wood stoves burning in the winter and taught the children in the Bible class. When my father and his siblings were growing up in Kansas, Meshach and Edith, their grandparents, provided a haven for them at their farm. When they were with my great-grandparents, their grandma and grandpa Schultz, my dad and his siblings found safety and warmth. They had plenty to eat. They had care and love and work to do. Meshach and Edith did all they could for my grandmother, their daughter-in-law, and for her nine children. My father, in turn, sought to provide the same for his grandchildren. They, too, are part of that cloud of witnesses. As I think of a future in which I'm no longer present, I hope that someday someone will see a picture of me <coughs> and tell a child something about the way I endured and persevered and helped to shape their faith. Friends, we run a race that is set before us, and the goal is not success, the goal is not wealth, <coughs> the goal is not popularity, the goal is not to force other people to believe as we do, the goal is not even to make sure this wonderful congregation survives. The aim, the goal we run toward is Jesus. The race we run is toward Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, or as he is named in Revelation, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. As we run our race, we keep our eyes fixed on him. We keep our focus on him. He's there to guide us. He's there to be the one that we run to. And every now and then, we look up into the bleachers and we see there that great cloud of witnesses, those faithful people who've gone on before us. This legacy of faith comes from God and was handed down to Abraham who believed in covenant and Moses who defied the government and set his people free to Rahab and Gideon and Barak and Deborah and Lydia and Paul and James and Meshach and Edith and Lenora and the people you have remembered and named in your hearts to you this moment and in the future. Someday, we will be part of that great cloud of witnesses ourselves. May we run with perseverance until that day, until we meet Jesus face to face at the finish line. Amen. Guide my feet.